I am so happy to be here with uh, my friends who are wanting to learn a little bit more about autism and vision. And so I'll go right in. This is my lovely family and my husband, Dr. Davis, and my son, Matthew, uh, on the left, uh, Elena, then Rachel, and Liz. And so um, I uh, am part of Daniel and Davis Optometry and uh, now part of Total Vision. And it's a, a group of private practice, uh, practices in uh, Southern California and Northern California. So I've been in practice now for 29 years and we have four doctors and four therapists and our specialty is in neurodevelopmental optima optometry. And that means that we're working with both uh, patients who have developmental needs and uh, neuro problems such as Parkinson's brain injury, um, uh, stroke and other neurological disorders. So I'm, uh, a Illinois College of Optometry and Western University College of Optometry clinical associate uh, professor. And we host a, a third or fourth year optometry student uh, every quarter to come to our office and learn how to um, work with uh, our patients and who with special needs. Um, I'm also a, a consultant and provider of vision therapy services for San Diego um, County School Districts. And I consult at the Tri-City Medical Center, as well as Scripps uh, Encinitas Brain Injury um, Clinic in the Rehabilitation Department for their brain injured um, patients. And I'm the immediate past president of the Neurooptometric Rehab Association International. So getting right into it, um, most of you know the prevalence of autism in the United States uh, keeps increasing each year. Uh, it's now, um, in 2020, the CDC came out that said it's one in 54 children. And that was with data that was from 2016. So it's four years behind. So we know that it's likely that's even more prevalent than one in 54. So my inspiration is my son for this talk. You can see how cute he was when he was a little boy. And now he's 23 and he just lights up our life. And he, um, he has quite a story and has led me on this journey um, through changing my career in working with autistic uh, children and adults. And he has taught me so much. So our learning objectives are um, to learn about individuals with autism and that they have uh, vision challenges. And um, I'll go over all of the different types of vision challenges that they have. Um, we're gonna go over the symptoms and the conditions that are commonly found. And I wanted to show you um, some strategies that I've learned from my son um, for children who are nonverbal and the treatments and therapy that can help them process visual information. So I get this question all the time of what's the difference between an eye exam and a vision developmental evaluation. And an eye exam that you get from your optometrist or ophthalmologist uh, measures visual acuity, which is the clarity of sight, uh, refractive status, which is um, telling you if you're nearsighted, farsighted, or have astigmatism, and also the health of the eye, which is the first line of um, of entry into having your child tested is um, to have a regular eye exam to make sure that the eyeballs themselves are healthy and that they can see. But a visual developmental um, evaluation measures the ability to gather visual information and process how it's perceived. So some of the common visual characteristics of um, patients with autism is that they have delayed ocular motor skills, um, which is the ability to uh, fixate and follow a target and to jump fixate from one point to another and to be able to fixate on a target that they are um, wanting to fixate on. Also delayed eye teaming skills, which means how the two eyes um, images can form one image to give you depth perception and make one uh, percept. Delayed central and peripheral uh, visual processing. And this one is um, interesting because most people don't realize that we have two visual systems. Um, our central um, visual discrimination system and our peripheral system that tells us where our body is in space and it detects light and motion. 
And those two um, systems have to coordinate together. So say you are um, driving at night and uh, you see a light that's flashing on your side vision, that's your peripheral vision, then um, your central vision can't tell what that is until it looks right at it. And so if those two uh, systems aren't coordinating together, it can cause uh, problems with processing. Also, we find that children um, with uh, autism have decreased sensory integration. And that means that they have um, difficulty with um, visually looking and um, touching, being able to um, coordinate your hand and eye motions, um, being able to motor through space, be able to listen while speaking, while looking, all of those are what we call sensory integration. Some other common uh, characteristics are photosensitivity. And there's a few reasons why that. Um, one is that many children with autism are in a sympathetic nervous system overload, which means that um, they're in fight or flight um, all the time. They're anxious, their heart is racing, um, they're um, not being able to focus. And uh, what occurs when you're in fight or flight is that the pupils dilate. And when the pupils dilate, then you're more sensitive to light. Um, also, when the pupils dilate, that affects your focusing system, which is the ability to make things clear. So even if you don't have a refractive error, you can have blurry vision because you have dilated pupils all the time. They also may be sensitive to the fluorescent light in the flickering of that. And so in some classrooms, they may have um, increased behaviors, uh, adverse behaviors, because they are sensitive to the fluorescent lighting. They may have visual hypo and hypersensitivity. Um, one of the hallmarks of autism is that they may be um, super sensitive to one sense um, or not sensitive at all. Um, like being able to um, be hyposensitive to touch means that they don't want to be touched and hypersensitive uh, or hyposensitive meaning that they want to be touched and hypersensitive that they don't want to be touched. Vision is in the same um, uh, realm as that, in that we have, uh, they may have perception of movement of stationary objects, um, which is confusing and uh, can make them anxious. They may misjudge um, the width and height of objects. Um, so uh, like running into a door that might be open, um, they may hyper-focus on certain objects and be not aware of their um, periphery. Uh, such as when my son was um, a young child, that he would be so hyper-focused on um, his toy that he wouldn't know that we were in the room even when we were there for an hour. Um, he was very hyper-focused with that. They may have reduced spatial awareness, which is that difficulty with regulation of all of those um, senses that we have. And uh, with that spatial awareness, they may have posture instability and may toe walk. Um, toe walking can be um, from a visual perceptual problem to where they can't judge that space correctly. And so they're always um, leaning forward and um, tapping on their toes. When we do therapy to help reorganize that space and teach that spatial awareness, and then the toe walking can stop. There's those perseverations that you see um, where they flick their um, fingers off to the side of their vision. They may be looking side vision um, or they have some hand flapping. Um, and that can be uh, from that, where is my body in space compared to where the objects are. And that central peripheral processing is that I'm stimulating that peripheral vision so that um, I can balance my nervous system. Others, uh, my son had this too with lateral vision um, where uh, you look at all his pictures and his eyes were always to the side. Um, he wasn't uh, facing and directly looking at you but always would look to the side. And that can be from a few different reasons, just like I was saying that, that central peripheral integration problems, um, as well as if the eyes don't coordinate together as a team well can cause that lateral vision. With um, other things that we see are uh, retained primitive reflexes. And primitive reflexes are um, 
reflexes that we're born with to help initiate a motor movement. And so you may remember if your child had um, was a baby that they have a sucking reflex where you tickle their cheek and they, they go to suck. And that's so that reflex is there so they can eat. And after eating for a few weeks, that reflex is then integrated and it's now moved to a higher uh, motor movement, which is being able to look and recognize the milk source, uh, whether it's from mom or from a bottle. Um, there's over 150 different reflexes. And um, in many of these cases, they um, they are still retained even into um, later childhood and that can restrict their progress and their visual, um, visual skill development and also motor skill development. When we look at uh, these two questions, where am I and where is it? That has, um, it's a visual processing of um, where is my body in comparison to things that are space? And then um, how can I locate where that object is? And that's very important for our eye teaming and our focusing system to find things in their accurate spot. Um, those who don't um, have this, skill developed will have um, problems with a lot of movement and flapping and touching everything that they see because they can't tell where it is and um, in relation to themselves. They may have delayed visual perception such as ability for visual memory, discrimination, uh, spatial relationships, um, being able to tell their right and left on their body as well as in space. So you'll see letter reversals um, and numbers. Uh, we also see midline shifts, or, um, which means that their perception of the middle of their body may be shifted to where if they perceive the middle of their body to be to their right, then they be um, leaning over towards their right in order to match that, um, their perception of the middle to with their body. And then um, as you move the, um, the person into an upright position, they may feel like they're falling. Um, this is also not just a side to side shift, but a up and down and a forward and back. And that is one of the things that we see with toe walking. And we do have um, treatments that work with that. We see a difficulty with uh, the person being able to cross their motor midline as well as their visual midline. And you need to have the ability to cross over their body midline before you can have visual. And what does that mean? Um, up until about two years old, um, when a child uh, picks up a toy on their right side, they'll bring it to the middle of their body and then put it over to the left side. Rather than picking up the, um, the item on the right side, crossing over their midline over to the left side. And that crossing midline is very important for getting the two eyes to coordinate together as a team, pass midline and go back and forth between that. Uh, so what we see um, with children with autism is a higher than average incidence of refractive errors. And um, this means that more children with autism need glasses than a neurotypical child. And we see this um, with nearsighted, farsighted and astigmatism. And we'll also see um, what we call anisometropia, which is that they have one eye that has a higher prescription than the other. And that can be a, a real problem because then the child is using just one eye to do all the work and the brain wants to shut off the eye that um, has that higher prescription. Uh, now, many of these children aren't able to tell you that they see blurry. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about how we can tell as eye doctors um, what their prescription is without them being able to, um, to speak or respond. So one of the ways that we test visual acuity, um, which is how, what is the clarity of sight, um, is through the standard eye chart. And um, this works for many uh, children um, who are able to um, identify and um, verbalize what they see. Um, there's also to the right, you'll see um, picture shapes. These are called Leah uh, cards. And so they might be able to match. So if I point to the first object in the 
um, that's on the chart in the distance, they may be able to um, match a card to uh, like the house to the house in front of them. Um, many times with children of autism that they have a difficulty with pointing, but they have better skills with matching. One of the most um, common ways that we check uh, children with autism and young uh, children, uh, um, even from one years old on up, is using what's called card of cards, which are the top picture. And what we find is that in order to, um, to determine whether a child can see, um, they'll always look towards a more interesting target if they can see. So if it, with um, black and white grading. And these particular cards um, have, using the grading technique, will have pictures. And the um, child, when presented with the, um, the card in, um, from about two feet away, um, if they can see the target, they'll look down or look up to where the target is, which is easier for the examiner to tell up and down rather than side to side. So here is a, um, a quick video of um, one of the ways that we're checking visual acuity in a child with autism um, with both eyes uh, working together. Then we also check the visual acuity with each eye separately. <gasps> And if you'll notice, even though it's quick, Daddy? he'll look at the picture Matthew? once we get his attention. So it's um, a great way to tell what they can see um, because that helps with um, talking to their other providers and uh, like their speech therapist and finding what size of letters to work with um, or icons in a picture card communication system or on an iPad communication system. Um, this is one of the, the common questions I get is um, how can you tell if my um, son or daughter um, needs glasses um, when they can't tell you which is better one or two. And so we don't um, do it in that fashion. We can check using a light that has a streak light. We shine it um, through the pupil, the patient's pupil, and, and move the target and see if the light that's shining back moves in the same direction or an opposite direction. If it's the same direction, we add a magnification lens. And if it's an opposite direction, we add a minification lens. And when the reflex doesn't move, then we have the prescription. And we use loose lenses rather than in um, that machine that comes in front of you called a Ferrapter, um, because they don't, you know, often like to have things that are in front of their face. So here's a quick video to show you an example of that. And our students that we should see, um, if you're a patient, they'll allow you to look at their eyes uh, once they know that the light, um, as I shine it on their hand first, is not going to hurt them and that um, we, are, we maintain our calm in order to help with their calm. The next thing that we're checking is how the um, eyes gather visual information and how, how efficient is it in gathering up visual information. And the two eye movements that we look at are called a pursuit and a saccade. A pursuit is the ability to fixate on a target and follow it in space um, in, uh, from left to right and up and down and in a circle. Um, and that's like following um, a person walking by or a car that's driving by, that's a pursuit. 
a cicade is the ability to jump fixate from one point to another and be accurate in that um, ability to do so. Um, so the research has shown with those um, visual uh, skills that they are reduced with autism and that can make it um, more difficult in uh, schoolwork, being able to use a communication device, being able to tell, again, where um, doing sports and paying attention. Um, so these are some skills that are teachable because they're just delayed and we need to um, help them learn these skills in order to meet their potential. So this is one of the um, observations that I'm making in evaluating a pursuit in a cicade. Um, with the target that we look at, um, most of the time with the kids with autism, they may not be interested in the target that I'm showing. Um, but that actually is good information for um, the examiner to notice um, because it sees um, what type of um, stimulus does it take and, and preferred to get them to um, uh, be interested enough to work hard to pursue the target. So what I have here is, um, a, a target that has little pictures on it. And I want to see how many seconds that he can maintain fixation on the target before losing that fixation. And then the second one is looking at, um, are, is he able to fixate right on the target when looking from left to right between two targets? Is he moving his head and body in order to do that? Or is he using just his eyes? And does he need, um, to take away that peripheral vision by turning off the lights and having it lit up in order to be more accurate when he's looking at those targets. So here's a video on that. Okay. Good, nice job. Now you'll see too that he has difficulty crossing visual midline and he moves his whole head in order to switch from one point to another. And he needs um, movement off to the side in order to tell where they are. And I check it with sound to see if the sound makes any difference in him locating the space. And what I was seeing there is that if it's lit and has sound, is he able to converge his eyes in order to um, make one target? And, uh, and he had difficulty with that as well. So some of the symptoms that you'll see with eye movement disorders are that difficulty following a target in space and where they're moving their whole body um, and, uh, or just their whole head in order to follow that target. Um, they move their, um, their head and body and they have difficulty finding objects in a room. So if you um, ask them to go pick up their, um, their backpack, they may, if it's a visually um, confusing room, they may have difficulty finding their backpack with other things that are around it. Um, they can have with the difficulty with the cicades, which is that jumping fixation from one point to another, they may would have difficulty with reading and losing their place while reading because their eyes are not accurately going from one word to, to another. Um, they may be uneasy in crowds and in malls and with lots of movement because they have difficulty moving their body through space and tracking at the same time. And then they, because of that, they can have um, car sickness, motion sickness um, when riding in a vehicle because their body is now the car moving through space and things that are going by them, their eyes are not um, tracking it correctly. And that can give you nausea as well as um, uh, motion sickness. So the second group of uh, visual skills is called um, accommodation or what we call um, a focusing skill. And this isn't a pay attention focus, but a make clear uh, focus. And the lens that's on the inside of the eye changes its shape to focus from near to far. And it relaxes and constricts um, in order to do that. And the brain is what controls the muscles in order to change that focusing system. Uh, it starts off being um, inaccurate as a baby. Um, so the uh, baby would 
look towards a large object um, to focus on it, but would have tar um, more difficulty being accurate in looking um, and focusing to make clear a small object. And so um, when we're testing uh, children, what we're looking at is, are they able to, um, even if they have no prescription for glasses, are they still able to focus and work to make the items clear and up close and then relax it to see in the distance. Um, and so this relates to being able to um, copy from the chalkboard, being able to um, focus from the computer to paper, from the teacher to close up, um, being able to, um, focus to make things clear, like when you are um, riding a bike and then looking at um, your watch. Um, so all of those things are being able to cha change focus um, from uh, one point to another is due to the accommodative system. Um, you'll see a lot of squinting and because they're trying to focus and um, headaches, usually in the front area of the head and the temple area. Um, and some of the kids who aren't able to explain uh, what they're feeling, um, you may see them uh, with head hitting um, against a wall um, and um, injuring themselves because of that. They may close one eye um, in order to make it easier to focus with one eye because focusing with one eye is easier than focusing with two together. Um, some of the other symptoms, uh, that fluctuation in um, where when you're reading, it goes clear to blurry to clear to blurry to clear. Um, and that makes it um, difficult for fluid reading and stamina. So they may be able to read, but they can't read for very long before things get blurry. And we talked about getting nauseous because of that. Um, but it also can lead to poor handwriting when you're copying from the board. And so when, um, say you're looking in the distance and the close up is blurry and you can't make it clear, then a lot of children will just um, look in the distance and copy without looking back at the paper. Of course, then that will make um, handwriting poor. But it also, even if they do look back um, at their paper, um, it's taking so long for it to become clear that um, when they're writing, it will look messy um, and it will not stay on the line. Um, you'll see these children um, put their head very close to what they're trying to look at um, and may be turning their head to look through just one eye when they're looking at near. So the next um, skill that we look at is how the two eyes coordinate together to train. And one of the um, biggest difficulties is if one eye is not aligned with the other, causing an eye turn. And um, in, um, for the average amount of uh, eye turns that you'll see in neurotypical population is about 4%. Um, but in children with autism, um, we see the studies are anywhere between 20 to 50% of children have an eye turn. And why does that make a difference? Um, it's because when you have an eye turn, um, it can cause uh, much delay in how their um, bodies are um, able to uh, coordinate. And it also, the eye that is turned, the brain has a choice. It'll either see double because the eyes are not um, aligned in the same direction, or the brain will shut off one eye, causing that eye not to develop um, correctly and it will see um, blurry even with correction. Um, so it's really important um, to have these children evaluated for strabismus um, because it's treatable if you catch it early and, um, and, and more easily treatable when you catch it early. It can be treated at any age, um, but it will reduce frustration um, with them and increase visual attention quite a bit if you are able to treat the strabismus. So the next video is looking at um, one of the ways that we get um, a child to uh, participate in the testing um, to see if they have an eye turn. 
And one of the things that um, I talked about earlier is getting them um, interested in fixating on a target um, so long enough for us to check how the eyes um, uh, work together, how long they can stay working together, and what's the degree of angle that the eye wants to turn. So we found that using a, a golf tee, putting in a straw is something that these kids usually like to do and um, they can be successful at it. What I'm doing is checking, um, is he able to have depth perception um, by putting the stick in the straw? Is he turning his whole head to look just at midline or can he look to the side to do it? Is he able to um, cross midline motorically from the right to the left? And does he cross visual midline? Now we're looking at a visual pursuit, how long he can maintain that fixation. And you'll see he closes his eyes because it is difficult um, for him to keep fixation on that, that target. And notice how much better he was able to do this than the previous video where it was an uninteresting target. Um, this one requires him to, in order for him to be successful, he has to try to put that stick in the, in the uh, straw. Now, why I'm holding his hand um, is that I'm seeing whether he could cross midline with each eye separately. Now this I'm using, um, it's called a prism. And what prism does is it stimulates um, the eyes either to cross or to turn out in order to maintain single vision. And what I'm looking at when I'm looking at his eyes is whether there is an eye that turns, um, that turns out or turns in um, and loses that fixation on the target. Now, so much of this is being patient. Um, He's very successful with it. And I can see because I was able to use a lot of prism that he was able to converge his eyes well. Um, and so he didn't have a difficulty with that eye Some of the symptoms that you'll see with eye coordination um, difficulties are um, children that overreach or underreach a target. So say they're going to grab a glass of water, you'll see them um, knock over the water because they're misjudging that depth um, or they're grabbing and the, um, before they even get to the water. Um, you'll see this a lot with um, trying to catch a ball, um, that you'll throw them a ball and they're delayed in, um, they'll either try to catch it before the ball actually hits them, or it'll hit them while they're before um, you, they're able to close their hands. They'll also have difficulty with judging the depth of stairs or curves. And my son had a, a real difficulty with this in that he didn't walk um, uh, smoothly until he was six years old. He didn't, he crawled until he was four years old, not because he had difficulty with the strength of his legs. Um, he worked with a physical therapist for a, um, a long time, but it was because of his vision and his decreased depth perception. Um, he had a very high prescription and it's one of the skills that we had to work on for him. And how we knew that he had difficulty with this is that as he was walking, um, after each step, he would lean over and touch the ground and take another step and lean over and touch the ground. Um, and it's because he couldn't tell where the ground was um, because his eyes weren't um, telling where it is. When you touch the object, then it gives you a better idea of where that um, depth is. And so you'll see these kids that are still in that I got to touch everything mode. Um, and that's often because their, um, their depth perception is off. Um, when for a child who is able to read and um, you'll, they'll see that the, when their eyes are not coordinating well together, that the print may move and float and kind of um, you'll be losing your place because there's like two images that overlap each other. 
They'll also um, uh, try to avoid looking at pattern wallpaper or um, crazy floors that you see in uh, a lot of uh, hotels that have a lot of patterns to it because it may look like it's floating, like there's um, it's coming at them. And that can be really disturbing for them. Um, we talked about double vision, which is one of the, um, the most frustrating things um, uh, for someone to have. I had double vision for many years, and um, what I did to get rid of that double vision is I closed one eye. And, um, and it wasn't until I was older that I had vision therapy to correct for that, and it makes it much nicer, <laughs> especially when I'm trying to drive, to have uh, the two eyes coordinating together. So if you see a child that is... Um, um, as you approach them, they close one eye or they're turning their head or they're getting their hair over one eye um, then or turning their head, then that is a, a significant symptom um, that alerts you to how their eyes uh, evaluated. They'll have um, often balance problems because of that depth perception. They can get dizzy and nauseous, have headaches, and we talked about the head tilts and turn. And they're timing a visual motor task um, that trying to do things in a quick motion because they have to judge that depth quickly um, can be affected if their eyes aren't coordinating together as a team well. So when we're looking at um, uh, how a child perceives where the middle of their body is and um, where their body is in space, we um, can affect that by using a type of lens um, called a prism. And a yoked prism is a special kind of prism that um, is where the lens is thick on one side and thin on the other. And when you put the lenses over both eyes, the direction of the thick part of the lens is going in the same direction. Now, some people have heard about prism in their glasses to help them see single, and that's called compensating prism. But yoked prism is um, something that's very helpful for um, patients who have this midline shift. Now, I'm gonna show you a, a video to describe this. This um, child has a, a perception difficulty where he doesn't know, um, he has difficulty uh, catching a ball and knowing where that ball was when it's moving in relation to himself. And um, so we use, because he has that perceptual midline shift. So what we do is we first test without the prism and then we put on um, the prism in one direction and see if that performance is improved in being able to hit the ball with the stick. And then we rotate the prism in another direction and see if it improves. And when we determine which direction the prism works, um, then that tells us where that perception of the line um, uh, is off for them. And then that helps guide us in the vision therapy that we can do to help them. So this is um, actually testing for that. So let's see if it goes. Sometimes the videos don't work. There you go. And you'll see how he approaches it because he can't tell where it's at and he overshoots it. He goes above the ball when he's trying to perceive where that ball is. how he's trying to slow down the ball so he can interpret where that is better. Now this one is the prism. You see how his whole head and body is turned? That's because what the prism does is change where the perception of the world is. It's shifting the what he's seeing over to the side. Now this one didn't improve in performance, but you'll see with this prism direction, what a difference it made with his um, perception of where things are. So the next category that we look at is once the eyes um, gather that visual information, how is it processing what we see? Now there is a um, condition called visual neglect or visual inattentiveness, and that is um, common after head injury, um, uh, especially severe head injury or stroke, um, but it can also be present in these children, especially if they had a difficult birth 
or they um, have other conditions, uh, comorbid conditions, such as a brain injury from hitting their head. Um, and this is often missed in a regular eye exam, but, and also in, um, in noticing this in a classroom. And um, often this visual neglect is on the left side to where, say they're looking at the wor a word, that they'll look from the middle of the word over to the right, but ignore the word off to the left. Or they're walking across the street and they're aware of the right side of the world, but not aware of the left side of the world. Um, now, of course, this can make a um, difficulty, not only academically, but for safety reasons. Um, and you'll see these children run out um, and not have a, a awareness of danger. And um, that can be, um, that can be scary. And so uh, I had a patient who um, had a cerebral palsy with um, a stroke and autism. And he um, came to our clinic when he was 15. And um, I was told that um, he's not able to read and he um, needs assistance crossing the street and he needs um, help with every single task because um, uh, of his conditions, but nobody knew that he had visual neglect. And um, once we found that he was not aware of the left side and we treated that, um, now he's able to do, um, he's learning how to read and um, his safety has improved. You'll see um, difficulty with um, attributes, judging size and depth, um, whether and also uh, shapes and um, coordinates, and that can affect your coordination. They have um, left and right confusion of because they don't know where their body is. So labeling it a, a left and a right can be confusing. And then if they don't have that, um, then if you don't have it on your body, you can't have it in space. And so letters and numbers can be reversed. And all of this can make you very tired. Um, you'll see kids with visual perceptual deficits get lost easily. They can have difficulty with visual memory um, and could be very good at uh, listening skills, but difficult um, with um, looking skills and remembering, remembering where they are, directions, um, comprehension. And you'll see uh, their processing speed very slow. And with um, Remember, I was talking about the um, busy carpets and crowds. Um, even that, even not only is it a I teaming problem, but it can be a visual perceptual problem because of that awareness of where their body is. And being able to visualize um, in their mind's eye, when you close your eyes and you can visualize what things can be if you manipulate them, um, can be a difficult skill because they can't. Um, they haven't learned it with their eyes open and with touch. So these are um, some examples of how we treat these visual conditions. Um, I wanted to put this picture up there because uh, vision therapy is fun. Um, we're working um, on uh, not only the eye tracking, teaming, and um, visual perception, but coordinating that with um, uh, balance and motion, cognitive skills, auditory skills, so that um, these visual skills are then generalized to everyday life. Um, so the tools that we have in our bag to help us um, improve the lives of these um, children and adults um, is one using therapeutic and prescription lenses. Prescription lenses are um, the ones that um, can help you see clearer, but therapeutic lenses are lenses that um, may help uh, develop that focusing and eye teaming ability, even if they see 2020 already. Um, and we use those with magnification and minification lenses to help stimulate that focusing system to learn um, how to make it more accurate and quick. Um, we use prisms like the ones that I showed you for yoke prism, as well as um, prism that stimulates the eyes to converge and diverge and move up and down. Uh, we may use certain types of occlusion, um, not just patching one eye, um, doing exercises, but sometimes we use um, 
uh, tape on the glasses and in order to decrease the visual noise that they see. And that helps with the eye tuning. Um, we can use filters and tints. Um, there's certain tints that um, affect the autonomic nervous system to um, become more balanced. So we talked about these children are often in uh, sympathetic nervous system mode and there's particular color filters that help um, balance out their nervous system more in the parasympathetics, um, which is a relax and uh, digest um, mode so that uh, their attention is better and that their comprehension is better. We use um, stereopsis fusion targets, which basically means um, three, 3D. Uh, you remember those 3D movies and 3D pictures? Um, if you don't have good eye teaming, then 3D images um, are either not able to be um, achieved to where you can't see it, or um, it's difficult and um, can give you a headache. And so we use these um, fusion targets um, to help develop those skills to where it's easy to see that 3D de um, depth. And then the brain prefers that. It always prefers having the two eyes work together as a team. Um, it's just if there is an eye turn, the brain takes the quick, um, uh, solution to it and just ignoring that eye. And so what we want to get is to where it works better together as a team. We use um, different equipment that is electronic that ha works with um, lights and timing and speed and processing. Um, like you saw in the previous picture, balance boards, swings, trampolines, because we need to have the patient in movement um, to coordinate that sensory integration. And we have a special program called the Sensory Learning Program that um, is a um, therapy that stimulates auditory, visual, vestibular, and the nervous system to coordinate together as a team. And there's a lot of activities that are that we do in therapy, thousands. <laughs> so each um, each child's therapy program is very unique to that person. Um, and it's all depending on what their goals are and what their um, deficits and strengths are too. So this video, um, let me give you some background, is um, a child that had um, a lot of behavioral um, issues, was um, moved through four different schools before I saw him for vision therapy. He has uh, an eye turn and a high prescription in his glasses and um, very uh, little idea of where his body is in space. And so I, one of the therapy activities is to, uh, for tracking, is to have him um, read uh, numbers as I'm moving um, the piece of paper that has the numbers written on it around in um, different um, gazes. And I want you to look at his posture. He's in um, a W posture um, with his legs and he's slumped over. And that's because he's very low tone with his body and um, uh, his posture is affected um, because it has it's underdeveloped. Um, and you'll see doing this task um, uh, is difficult for him. And uh, I want you to look how his head is moving too. Seven, now what goes nine, what's the next number? What is it two? Nine? Is it two or five? No. Nine. And you'll see that he's memorizing the numbers. <laughs> Now you see, once I give him a grounding of where his body is, now he can move his eyes and um, develop that tracking as long as his body is grounded by me holding him. And now I put him right after this on uh, a swing and that tells him where his body is because it's moving. And he still has full head movement, um, but we're getting started with that uh, visual pursuit. 
Now this is um, the same child doing a visual saccade where there's um, lights that um, uh, shine on the, uh, the board here and he has to press the button in uh, order for the next light to appear. And I want you to see, um, we're also teaching the ability to look accurately and to touch at the same time that you're looking. Many of these kids will look and then look away and then touch. And so they're often touching um, the uh, selection on their communication device that is not what they want um, because they're um, not maintaining that look and touch. I also, um, in this video, um, didn't direct him because I wanted to see how um, is he using his pointer finger. Now the pointer um, finger is the most sensitive of all of the fingers and it's often one that um, the children will avoid. So you'll see him use different fingers in order to push the button rather than his pointer. Um, so in the therapy, we work on um, that sensitization of um, the pointer fingers so that he's able to use that to point to items that he would like. Now notice he doesn't have that grounding that we were talking about. And so that's why he drops as well. And that peripheral vision, um, being able to notice where that is. You'll also see him crossing the midline where he moves his whole body and his head in order to avoid crossing midline and using his thumb or another finger in order to press the button. And see how he's wow, avoiding crossing good. midline yeah, there. So in the therapy, what we would do is start to see, uh, looking at how is he um, attempting this task. And then um, we uh, give practice in redirection on being able to um, maintain their balance. We put them on a balance board. Um, we may hold one hand while he has to cross midline um, and um, direct um, for him to use his pointer finger. And there's other things that we do to get to this point um, to improve his visual saccade. Here is a, another instrument that we have that's, um, that's popular, that's called the talking pen. And it's a pen that lights up um, if you're accurate in touching the um, red circle, um, then the pen will buzz and go beep. And then um, you go from left to right, left to right, left to right, as if um, you are reading. And so these, it starts with big circles and then goes to small circles. And if your um, pen is touching the black and not the red, then it doesn't buzz. So it gives a, um, a feedback uh, loop to the student in order to um, train them to uh, be able to be more accurate in their fixation and, um, and jump to the next point. Now this video um, is a student who is um, learning that, um, that look and touch, being able to use their pointer finger and, um, and be able to alternate between pointing with the right hand and the left hand. You can turn the volume down a little bit. You'll see how difficult it is for him um, to maintain fixation of it, but it gives him that feedback when it lights up. And alternating is also difficult in initiating that alternation. Now we're doing the same thing. At, we're just looking to see how he solves his problem of pointing the buttons from left to right. Um, and so he was able to look back and forth with that. But now we're trying to work the next thing on crossing midline. So we're holding one hand and having him go from one side to the other. See how this is much more difficult? How he wants to use either side of his body rather than crossing that motor midline. 
And again, it's not just the motor midline um, that has to come before the visual midline, uh, which is needed for reading. Now this next video is um, looking at uh, direct, a few things. Directionality, which is um, the ability to tell what direction things are going. We can use arrows like up, down, left, or right, or we call tumbling E's, where an E is pointing up to the left, to the right, or down. And he's matching um, these cards in the squares um, to a distant target um, so that it's a near far um, a focusing uh, exercise. And it's also um, a exercise in learning spatial relations because he's having to put the right card in the right square. So you can see. You can see the distance, target. And see how he has to look far than near, then far than near. And then we just make it more difficult by increasing the number of squares. Um, and that works on that location. But we've also made it more difficult by adding a prism. What the prism does is that he has to work harder to converge his eyes to make it single, what he's looking at. Um, and it's why he's trying to avoid it. <laughs> um, because, um, but it's, it's, as he's doing that, he's, um, and it's working, is increasing his stamina of being able to um, work his eyes together as a team and focus at the same time. Now, when you have an eye turn, um, and I like this picture mainly because um, you'll see um, this uh, gentleman has one eye that is fixating on my finger, but where he perceives my finger is off center when he looks to um, his right, and then in the opposite off center when he looks to the left. And you can imagine um, him trying to motor through space um, and not run into doors when he is, um, or tripping over objects when he's walking, um, difficulty with reading, um, when his perception of space is altered like this. Um, this is an example of um, a, uh, one of our uh, students who um, had difficulty with having both eyes coordinate at the same time and turning on. Um, he had an eye turn that the one eye, the brain wanted to suppress. So we use red green filters um, in order to um, train both eyes to stay on at the same time. So these red and green lines that are um, over a piece of paper that has a um, pictures on it, he has to match the cube to the picture that's underneath it. But if one eye is shutting off, he can't see what's underneath those red and green lines. Um, so it's a nonverbal way of training um, anti-suppression um, techniques. Uh, this is my son way back when, and he's using a similar uh, type of task where he has to um, wear the red and green glasses. And in order to match the pictures, both eyes have to stay on at the same time. This is one of the um, uh, attribute uh, um, matching exercises that we do where um, the student has to match a word uh, that describes the shape, um, whether it's a triangle or a square, um, the size, whether it's small or large, and the direction, um, which way it's pointing. Now this video um, uses a, um, uh, a schedule that um, gives a, the, the student um, an idea of what's first, what's next, um, and how many things to complete before they're all done. And this is his mom um, going through the different exercises. 
But what the exercise on this that we're working on um, illustrates how um, we start with uh, visual motor integration and um, uh, gross motor and fine motor activities. So gross motor always comes before fine motor. And um, what we often see is that um, uh, children are taught to start riding before they um, know where their arms are in relation to their body. And so we go back a step further and see, are they able to um, move their arm from as high as they can go all the way to low? Um, and then we do from the elbow, then to the wrist, and then to the hand. Um, so it goes in that order. What we're looking at is how their posture is and are they able to cross their uh, motor midline um, and what is the range of motion that they can do with their arms before we go into um, writing on paper. So you'll see how he's avoiding midline by turning his whole body. So then we move that sometimes and he has how he's wanting to go from midline to the right rather than all the way across. Trying to get both um, arms to move in simultaneous movement. And at first we have to do hand over hand and then um, we can move to where he's doing it himself. Um, so he gets the motion first and what it feels like with his arms before we go to um, a smaller object. Oh, I got all my videos starting at the same time. <laughs> so um, the video that's on the left side is training um, the uh, right and left awareness on his body. He's having to um, touch the right side of his body and tell what direction he's going to go and then go to the next corner and tell what direction he's going to go. Right. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Which way are you going to turn it out? This side. Left. Yes. So you have a big one that's going to work better for them. Good. Good. And are we going that way? Are we going that way? Which is this side. Left. Good. Right. Great. Now, this one is working on auditory timing and sequencing with um, color matching, visual discrimination. And um, he's having to put the cubes in the, I, I'm giving the cubes out to him at the beat and um, to see if he can keep up with that beat in making um, those matching decisions. Ready, go. So you see what was great there at the end as it was piling up that then he was able to problem solve and group them together in order to get them in the right container and be able to do them simultaneously. So that was... Um, uh, great problem solving on his part. This next one is um, working on the visual motor integration, again, starting with large objects and then going to, um, to small. Circle under the X, over the circle, under the X, circle, under the X, over the circle, under the X, over the circle, under the X, over the circle, under, the X, over the circle, over, under. And we're looking to see how much prompting we need. And, and I'm also giving him an idea of where his body is in space. Under the X. 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 Under the X.
And this exercise um, is working on a few things. It's working on uh, right and left awareness, um, sequencing, um, discrimination of the letters and visual tracking um, all at the same time. Okay, so now what we're gonna do, Lance, is we're gonna switch our hands that take the peg out. So whatever letter I call, you're gonna use your right hand first, then the next letter will be your left hand, and then the right hand and then the left hand, okay? Okay, that's right. All right. Yes. All right, X. W. C. So you can see how um, he's having to remember directions, uh, multi-step directions, and do that tracking simultaneously. Now this video is um, with a student that we're working on multi-step directions as well as um, uh, directionality and laterality and discrimination. And so he's um, being asked to um, pick up a certain color cube and put it on either the left or right side. Listen, take your right hand, pick up the yellow bar, put it on the left side. That's it, Marty. Good job. Good job. Now this one, this um, student was learning sequencing on um, kind of pre-reading exercises for vision to where he was looking at the um, above sheets going left to right in the patterns. And so it's like red, yellow, blue, yellow. And then he would tap with his hands on the ones that are um, down below, that paper down below, red, yellow, blue, yellow. And seeing how many um, squares he can group together um, with a visual sequential memory. And, um, and also the focusing from uh, top to bottom and location of space. Now, um, when we're looking at doing vision therapy, we're always um, providing situations where um, it gives them the feedback of where they are and where it is. And um, we start with having full um, gravitational support, such as when I was holding on to the child and or putting them on a swing um, or even laying on the ground, and then decreasing that gravitational support, uh, such as having them on a trampoline, standing on one foot, putting on a balance board. Um, all of those things then um, help generalize those visual skills. And this is the um, the special equipment that we have um, called our sensory learning program. And it uses um, uh, phototherapy um, using different tint um, colors to um, auto, um, uh, stimulate the autonomic nervous system to become balanced. And it has an auditory integration program. And the student is lying on um, a motion table that goes up and down and si uh, side to side, and then also turns 90 degrees to go forward and backward and up and down. Um, and so um, by doing this, it's stimulating uh, vestibular, ocular, uh, motor, and auditory systems and the autonomic nervous system together uh, for sensory integration. And this is a very um, popular program with our, um, our students in that we, uh, for the children who have um, uh, many issues with sensory integration, we will start with this therapy um, for the first half of our session and then end with a um, therapy that has more cognitive um, tasks to it. I did an entire um, webinar on this um, uh, particular system that is on our YouTube channel. And um, so this is the YouTube address um, that you can uh, look at that. So how does vision impact um, academics? Um, it, if you don't have clear, single, comfortable vision, um, it makes uh, difficult 
with copying and focusing, scanning, tracking, all of those things that I was talking about today, um, and it affects um, behavior. Um, social skills, uh, when you improve that ability to um, fixate, um, that it proves eye contact, being able to discriminate uh, facial features, um, and uh, which in turn helps them learn um, emotions, to understand emotions. Uh, communication, uh, we went over this a bit, and being able to um, point to what they are wanting, um, scanning, selecting, that visual verbal discrimination, um, and motor coordination, that um, anything that is visually guided, uh, such as walking and running and riding, catching, throwing, and kicking. Um, and so this is the introduction to our optometrist in our office, uh, Dr. Dukes, uh, you saw earlier, uh, myself, my husband, Dr. Davis, and Dr. Jeanette. Um, and these are our wonderful vision therapists, uh, Dinah, Melissa, Felicia, and April. And um, for more information on this, you can uh, visit our website, um, danielanddavisoptometry.com. Also, um, there's a lot of information um, and research that is on the College of Vision Development uh, website, and that's covd.org. And then the organization that's near and dear to my heart, because I used to be president of, um, the Neurooptometric Rehabilitation Association. Um, and that uh, website also gives a lot of information on the things that I talked about today.